always fun to come into one of these seminars and have an opportunity to uh, bend your ear about one thing or another. Um, I see in the crowd here about half, half the audience are my own students, so I want to apologize because I think they've probably heard most of what I've got to say many times and probably get tired of me uh, preaching about some of these things, but we'll, we'll, we'll give it a shot anyways. So yeah, so I, I uh, the title, uh, I, I picked the, the, to be a little different from um, from uh, you know, sort of a, a normal topic uh, presentation, uh, but I think it actually captures uh, what I want to talk about uh, because because I, I thought today was might be an opportunity to reflect a little bit about uh, about my interests and motivations uh, for the research that has been going on for a long time, uh, one way or the other. Um, and, and much of my work has focused on developing agent-based micro-simulations for a wide variety of applications in urban systems on both the land use side, involving the urban system as a whole, but also transportation. And that land use motivated is very much, you know, I started clearly with an interest in travel behavior, as I'll talk about it, but you can't understand travel behavior if you don't understand the urban context within which it exists, the transportation land use interaction. And uh, some of you have you know, heard me talk about this in the 1535, some of you may next term hear me talk about this, uh, but you know, there's a fundamental transportation land use interaction that I think we have to take seriously, so that's why I'm interested in both the travel behavior per se, but that larger, larger context. Um, and, uh, and, and so, um, as I, I think this presentation is largely to, to, I'm going to try to justify this notion of agent-based micro-simulation or motivate why it's the approach that uh, we've, I've, been, I've been emphasizing. But maybe even to step back a little bit from that in terms of talking about motivation and sort of how I got to be here standing in front of you is I actually started life here at U of T in the engineering science program in aerospace engineering. You know, I liked airplanes and rocket ships. I thought that's what I was going to do. Um, but partway through my undergraduate, I got exposed to uh, transportation planning, uh, transportation systems analysis, and I discovered that that's really what I was interested in. That maybe I wasn't really a hardware guy. I wasn't going to design the next jumbo jet. Um, but I was very interested in uh, transportation because it represents you know, it's a, it's a classic example of uh, the human-machine interface. It's a, it's a technological system, a big system, an infrastructure system, but it's fundamentally has embedded in these funny things called human beings. And uh, the reason we build these things is to serve, to serve ourselves, to serve human beings. But how the system itself operates depends upon the actions of people. So uh, I, found, I found that fascinating. I, I found the interplay between engineering, technology, so, uh, physical sciences uh, with the social sciences in order to understand uh, you know, uh, these, these components of the system um, that were not technological, they were, they were you know, biological. Um, and, 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 and so that this, this intrigued me, but also as, a, as an engineer, I guess, um, I was also highly motivated by the notion that we should be uh, to need better methods, better understanding in order to build better systems. Um, so there's in my work, uh, some of my work has been very theoretical, some of it's been a bit more applied, but always, uh, even if I don't do it myself, the motivation has always been from a policy point of view. Um, we need to understand the system if we're going to intervene into it and design it better to meet societal goals of environment, equity, uh, efficiency, um, and, and so on. And, and so that's that, that, uh, that motivation to, to uh, provide the tools that allow us to better design and intervene in the system has always been underlying what we do. So, you know, I've always fundamentally believed um, uh, particularly as an engineer, but, but also I, I would say as a scientist, um, that's not enough just to understand. It's not enough just to build a model. We have to be able to implement it, and we have to be able to use it. Um, and so, uh, you know, writing a paper it's, it's, that uh, you know, presents the latest, greatest, uh, you know, uh, whatever, uh, I don't think is enough. I mean, I think that's very important. It's very, you know, 
know, co contributing to the scientific knowledge is very important. But we really, sh it should be always moving us towards better practice, better implementation. So in my, in my research group, in my research, uh, that, that implementation side has always been as important as the theory and model building side. Um, we build, we, the theory and model building are very important. We want to do the best possible, build the best theoretical model we can, and that's been a very big motivation for me. Is, 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 you know, can, can we bring better theory to building practical to build practical models that eventually we can implement? Um, and so, what I, I kind of want to do is, is I'm going to spend the rest of the time this morning that I have really kind of unpacking that title to a certain extent and talking talking through it. The first one is the word hypothesis. Um, and I have various dictionary uh, definitions here. I always like the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's where English language resides. Um, but, uh, you know, so hypothesis is, is a provisional supposition. It's something we think is true, but uh, we can't leave it there. Uh, as a scientist, we, we, put a, we put a hypothesis up there so we can test it and so we can learn. And, and, and discover whether, in fact, it is true or not. And this is the way science proceeds, is, is that we observe the world around it, we form some hypotheses about how the world works, and then we go out and test it. And, and, um, and, and, and so, you know, and this is particularly clear in the physical sciences. Um, Einstein's theory of rel special theory of relativity and general theory of relativity are accepted not because they're elegant and beautiful uh, equations and, and they seem to make sense, they're testable. Uh, we've been able to empirically verify that, that, that both the special theory and the general theory are correct as far as they go, and that's why they're accepted. Um, and I think that's very important, uh, and because in other, in the social sciences, and nothing against the social sciences, the idea of a theory is, or a hypothesis, is fuzzier. Okay, and our ability to test theory, uh, I think, is, is more limited in many respects. And I think that's actually a challenge in the field. That, uh, you know, can we, because I think it is the hypothesis formulation and testing and rejection of hypotheses that prove to be weak or untrue, that's the way we proceed. And one of my complaints in travel behavior, uh, in travel behavior theory is I, it, you know, I don't think we reject hypotheses very often. I've just finished writing, I'm re revising a draft chapter for a, a, a handbook on travel behavior, and I, I kind of politely there uh, I'm complaining about, in some ways, the weakness of some of our theories of transportation. I'll maybe talk a bit more about that as we go. Uh, so anyways, I've always said, having said that we want to take an agent-based micro-stimulation approach where appropriate, uh, as, as our approach, but this is a hypothesis. In building these models, um, we're testing that hypothesis, and we always have to be open to the notion of rejecting it. That you know what, micro simulation isn't uh, isn't useful here, or we can, or we have a simpler method. So, so we should never blindly, um, you know, lock ourselves into one tool, one point of view. We have to, we always have to be open to the possibility there's a better way of doing things, and maybe we're not quite right in, in, in our assumptions. So, so I, I hope throughout our work over the years that we have always been challenging ourselves uh, to simply not assume this is the best way of doing things, but to try to, try to demonstrate. So agent-based microsimulation, um, which um, can shorten to ABM if we want, um, uh, starts with the notion of agents. Um, and I'm going to talk a lot more about agency in a minute. Um, but an agent basically is an intelligent object um, that uh, perceives the world around them, makes decisions, and acts into the world. Um, and I'm going to argue that the, an agent-based approach, thinking explicitly about human agency, is, first of all, from a modeling and computational point of view, it's a highly efficient, highly extensible um, approach to modeling, but even more fundamentally, it's behaviorally sound. Uh, your sound approach to, 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 um, to the approach. And then the other half of this, which I also try to unpack uh, a, bit, a bit later, is talking explicitly about microstimulation and what we mean by that. Um, so, um, maybe stepping just a little back from that, but, but in order to go forward, um, 
another way of, of viewing, I think, the problem that we are all dealing with in the travel behavior and modeling field is I've always argued that there are kind of four big components, four pillars uh, of modeling. Um, and this applies to anything, not just travel behavior. Um, you know, again, I think we have to start with theory. Um, you know, what is our understanding of how this system, whatever the system is, or whatever the behavior is, or the process that we're trying to model, what, what is our understanding of how it actually works? What is our theory? In order to, uh, but, but then again, theory itself in isolation is not enough. We have to be able to, first of all, test, is the theory correct? And second of all, hopefully implement, if it is correct, if it is usable, at least, um, implemented in, in ways that, it, it, that is useful to us in one way or another. To do that, we will always need data. We always need information about the real world. It's, it, you know, because that's what we're trying to ultimately model. We're trying to get a representation of a part of the real world that's useful to us. Um, and, and, and so the, and the only way we can understand the world is by observing it, right? Um, if we couldn't observe the world, we wouldn't know the world existed, we wouldn't be modeling it, we wouldn't worry about it. So data is always critical, first of all, for us to be able to form a hypothesis, but um, also to test. And, you know, and to say what I've already said in another way, um, in, in the scientific method, um, there are actually two major processes, two, two major ways people do science. One is through induction, is the inductive approach where we literally do observe the world, and from that we try to get, we try to, to uh, we try to describe what we see, we explore it, and out of that, that, this is where hypotheses and theories come from, as we say, oh, look at this, well, you know, I think maybe this, in order to explain what I see, here's a theory or a hypothesis that would explain what's going on in the system, so, um, you know. Um, and uh, so that's the inductive approach. And then the deductive approach is then hypothesis testing. Given that we formulated a hypothesis, we go back to the data and we see whether, whether we can uh, accept, or at least not reject, or reject the hypothesis as through, as through this loop of induction and deduction that science proceeds. Now in order to do that, we need methods. We need you know, regression, uh, you know, statistical estimation methods. We need uh, optimization methods. Uh, we need data collection methods. We need computer software to uh, GIS systems to display and manage spatial data. We need, we need database management systems to manage the data. So we need hardware, software, and computational methods for if, we're going, if we're going to, uh, uh, you know, undertake um, the development, you know, this theoretical ex exploration, but also eventually turning things into models. Uh, that are you know, that are useful, um, and uh, and uh, this is uh, you know I think important in any field of inquiry. It's certainly important in our field. Our field of transportation systems analysis, travel demand modeling, uh, is a child of the computer. Uh, our field did not exist in the 1920s or 1930s, let alone the 1800s. Uh, you know people. There were economists and other people thinking about some of these things, but in, in practical terms, um, the way we actually observe the system or capture information about the system in a usable way is with the computer. And our field really started in 1955 with the release of the IBM 360 computer, it's the first practical high speed digital computer. And our field has been growing ever since, it's grown absolutely in lockstep with our computational capabilities in terms of hardware and software which of course these days are enormous. I mean, you folks don't appreciate the power, computing power you, you, know, you, you have in your pocket in your smartphone, let alone you know, on these machines here. Um, we still need more, we'll always need more, we'll always be limited in various ways, but, but uh, what we can do within the virtual world of the computer uh, is, is that's our laboratory. Uh, so, so all of this is very important in terms of uh, what we're able to do in terms of uh, our modeling theory. And so computing uh, is, is central to all of this. So what I want to do uh, in, 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 in the rest of this talk is, first of all, um, I want to focus on theory. I want to make some comments about theory, and in particular, try to talk about my kind of approach, my view, on how we should be approaching this problem. Um, so, I, so I'm not going to talk about, well, we'll see what I have to say. And then, and then, uh, and that's sort of the age and base 
side of the talk. And then I will say a bit about computing, specifically you know, the you know, micro-simulation as a computational method to implement our theory, or test our theory. So there's much I can say about theory. Um, and as I said, I just finished writing a, a rather lengthy chapter. Uh, we'll see how it's received. Um, but, um, uh, uh, and, and, you know, we, we definitely have theoretical constructs uh, that we can make use of in, in, in our work. By far, you know, I think the dominant theory, if you will, that, that, that permeates through certain travel behavior modeling is random utility theory, which uh, emerged in the early 70s. Um, has been in use ever since. It has been, been elaborated uh, in you know, massive, in all sorts of different ways, all sorts of different applications. So, so I mean, this has been the workhorse for work throughout my lifetime, which is getting longer and longer. Um, and, and so, it's been it has been an extremely practical, useful approach to many modeling problems. But I would argue. Um, it's largely a framework for deciding how we make decisions. So it, 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 at its core, random utility theory says this asserts axiomatically, because it's actually not testable um, in, a, in a concrete way, that people make decisions by maximizing utility. And then it goes on to define what it says meant by utility, and you know, and then we can build a mechanism to to try to say, try to Identify at least the probabilities of what the maximum utility alternative will be, and you know, so then there's many implementations of that. Um, so, uh, so it's it's kind of as I say, it's sort of, it's sort of a, uh, a framework within which um, it, it's asserted that this is how people make decisions, and then we, but then we, but it doesn't go much further than that, uh, and we have to bring more understanding, more theory. Um, to actually operationalize these models. So I like to think we're sort of, sort of a container that we can pour whatever understanding we have of, of first of all, what are people doing? What, what are the actual decisions? Why are they making those decisions? Not to, not to maximize utility, but you know, what, why do people travel? Why do people cho uh, choose modes? When are they going to occur? Or when are they going to uh, um, happen? Um, uh, you know, what actually is utility? What, what utility is a benefit we get measure the benefit we get from the decision. Well, how do we really measure that, uh, given that it's a latent variable? Uh, why do we travel? Uh, and, you know, constraints on when we travel. And utility theory says we're choosing an alternative from a choice set C. It tells us nothing what that choice set should be. Uh, and, you know, it also says that, that there's a systematic utility. Okay, well, what are the variables in the systematic utility? So random utility theory per se doesn't tell us anything about that. So we have to bring further understanding to it. And that's what sort of this slide is saying, is that, again, we have, so we understand there's a transportation land use interaction. Um, so, so flows in the system are a function of the activity system and the transportation system interacting. We have our logit models. These are frameworks, but I think we are actually lacking, still after all this time, a lot of consistent, coherent, sort of standardized views of, of you know, what are the actual values of time out there? What are the, what, you know, what is an appropriate rule of socioeconomics? How do we model destination choice? Um, and, and so on and so forth. So I think there's actually a lot of fundamental theoretical work that uh, I think we can still be making, uh, still be undertaking. You know, we have a million papers out there on, on travel to and how many more choice papers have been written in the last, 40 years, um, can we can we actually summarize what we've learned from that in a way that we don't have to keep writing mode choice modeling papers? Here, here is how we understand mode choice. It's, that is transferable, fairly universal, and so forth. So, so I think there's there's much more we can be doing uh, to actually firm up, perhaps in an operational sense, our, our theories about travel behavior in a fundamental way. Um, you know, these are a few quotes from. Um, uh, a few people I have a, a lot of regard for. Professor Soberman was my mentor. He's, he's the, again, he's the reason I'm here. Um, uh, his, he inspired me to, to work in this field. Um, you know, he, he was talking largely about the consulting industry, not so much um, academia. But, but you know, uh, you, you, can, you can read you can read the, the, the quote uh, there, which I think is very true. And I think to a certain extent that can apply in academia too. If we keep repeating the same kind of research over and over again, and, and but do we really make progress? 
Um, Ezra Hauer was another uh, world-class world class, uh, researcher and professor here. I mean, they're, they're both Americans now, they're both retired. He was probably the world leader in, in road safety, statistical analysis, putting road safety analysis on a statistical footing. Um, he would harass us at you know, PhD committee meetings and things, you know, we'd be presenting our logic models or whatever, and say, well, yeah, the T-stats are a little weak, and you know, could it fit, it uh, could be better, uh, but you know, we didn't have enough data, blah, blah. And so he you know, he sort of said, do you ever reject a model? Do you ever say, no, you know what, this wasn't a good idea? Um, how, so again, how do we learn? If we, if we don't reject models, um, uh, then, uh, then how, how, how will we make progress? And then Jeffrey West was the president of the Santa Fe Institute. He's actually a physicist who got interested in cities. Um, you know, and I, I was once at a conference with him over lunch talking about you know, our random utility models. You know, and I just, I, it was just a routine. I said, you know, well, yeah, you know, yeah, maybe there's 40, 50, 60 parameters in a typical model. And he, he, he hit the roof. Because he's a physicist, he's equal to you know, E equals M C squared describes uh, you know the universe. Um, uh, uh, he, he, he didn't believe that that could that, that, that this represents science. Because if we have to have 60 parameters in a model to explain something, and those parameters are empirically derived from a small sample in one location and are not transferable elsewhere, is in fact is in fact that good science? Um, and I think that's something we need to be asking ourselves more. Uh, so I think another, and I've been using these two words somewhat interchangeably, but I think it's important to keep track of this from a, is theory and models are not the same thing. Okay, so theory is our understanding of a system. Models are almost inevitably how we implement that theory in some sort of testable or applicable application way. Um, models are simplifications and abstractions of reality. They're not reality, whereas theory is supposed to be trying to describe reality. Um, now, there's always a blur between the two, and as I say, the, about the only way we can test theory is through models or through empirical analysis. Also, or conversely, models should always be thought of as a hypothesis test. When you write a utility function and load, well, first of all, if you say, I'm going to use a random utility model, let's say, just a moment on the logic model, that's a, that's a hypothesis you're asserting, because you're asserting that this random utility maximization is, is a good way to represent the decision that you're trying to model. So that's a hypothesis. Um, every variable you put into the utility function uh, is a hypothesis. You're asserting you think this variable is important affecting this decision. Your, your, your assumptions about how to generate choice set, the rules used to generate the choice sets in that model are hypotheses. Um, and, and, and again, I don't think we often, I think it's better in academia, it's much worse in consulting, but even in academia, I don't know that we always take uh, I understand that these are hypotheses. I mean, yeah, we do. You know, we, we have expected signs, expected magnitudes. We always discuss the parameters, but but um, so maybe so. You know, we are kind of hypothesis testing. But I think we really have to understand. You know, keep that front of mind. Um, that uh, that uh, you know, by posing a model, it, again, simplification. simplification of reality, it's also a simplification of our theory usually because we may have a more complicated theory or you know conceptual understanding of something, but because of data or computational limitations, we can't implement that full theory. So the model is often an approximation, simplification of the theory level in the world. Um, but again, I think it, it's, it's very important for us to be humble as we think about these things as we approach this problem. The other aspect of this, and I'm sounding very kind of crotchety about all of this, is we have a tough problem here. I mean, we're trying to model human behavior. That's a really tough thing to do, uh, okay? And we're trying to, usually trying to do this so we can make some projections into the future. So these are really tough problems. So it's not as if this is a trivial problem to deal with, but, uh, you know, I, I think we, it's, it's important that we sort of keep challenging ourselves on this. So th this is all kind of leading up to, um, at least in, in, in my own view of things, is, is uh, and I've been kind of doing this for some time, and again, it sounds like I'm the only, the only one asking these sorts of questions or approaching this way, but I, 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 I've been trying particular, well, I would say for some time now, but, but it's, in some ways I'm getting even more conscious of that, of saying we really need to step back, um, and that we need a new approach 
to, let's say, building the next generation of models or a new approach to try to actually enrich our theory. Um, and, and, and part of this is, is I think, uh, you know, I think it's important to uh, not start with, uh, with flow charts and equations. It's very, you know, particularly as engineers, we want to write the equation, we want to write that flow chart, the pseudocode, we start, and, and again, part of that's inevitable, how do, how do we think about a system or a process? How do, how do we verbalize that, if you will? Well, flowcharts, equations, etc., are very useful ways, uh, they're languages, with which we can try to express our ideas both to ourselves and to others. So, you know, I draw lots of flowcharts, I write lots of equations. But perhaps more, you know, I would say, you don't start by saying, um, and I'm picking on random utility here, and I apologize to the random utility, the discrete choice modelers in the room. Um, you don't start by saying, I'm going to build a nested logic model of this. You start by saying, what is the problem? What is the behavior? Uh, what do I know about this? And then, and, then, and, and then, having described as best as possible what you think the process is, uh, what it is you're modeling, uh, and, you know, and also what data you have, then you say, okay, I need to build a model of this. What tools, do I, what methods do I have available to, to implement my ideas? And it may well be the nested logit is the most practical or most useful or most powerful way of implementing those ideas. But you don't start by saying, uh, you know, discrete choice model random utility theory is the, is the solution to all my problems. Um, you start with what is the problem? You know, there's an old saying that if you have a hammer in your hand, everything looks like a nail. Um, and then this is, and we see this throughout, the, throughout lots of engineering, lots of science. Somebody's a specialist in whether it's operations research or it's, it's, it's discrete choice modeling or it's I don't know what. Um, and so you have a tool and you keep trying to fit problems into that tool. Up to a point maybe that's fine if you're careful about choosing problems that actually fit your tool. But I think we have lots of times where we, we, we start by simply assuming a structure that we know how to implement and whether or not it fits the actual behavior. Um, so I think that's very important. Um, so so what's, the, what's the counter to that? Well, as I'm going to uh, talk about in a minute if I ever get there, um, and I think you start by, again, you start by looking at the world around you and, uh, and what I'm going to argue, one approach is say, well, what are the key building blocks or the key processes that actually are involved in the system that, that, that describe the system? And then again, we'll worry about perhaps how we, how we implement that in an operational model. The other big concern I have, I have um, is that we are modeling we should be modeling dynamics. We should be modeling process. Um, this is particularly important uh, in land use. You know, cities are dynamic things that evolve. You know, today looks a lot like yesterday, but today isn't quite the same as yesterday. The buildings gone up here. Somebody's moved. Uh, a few people died. A few people moved in. Uh, the city is continuously changing. The city is not in equilibrium. The same thing upholds some travel behavior. Uh, you know, that our decisions today are a function of our memory, experience, and so forth that we've experienced over time. Uh, our, our planning uh, of what we're going to do depends both on what we've already done and what we are expecting to do in the future. So, so you know, life is a dynamic, event-driven phenomenon, but almost all our models are, are, are static. Um, they're static cross-sectional models. They're, they're, the models are implemented based on cross-sectional travel survey data, usually. Um, they're modeling a point in time. Um, and, and I think that's problematic, both from a theoretical point of view, do we really understand behavior? Uh, it's, it's problematic from an application point of view. Do these, mo are these models, will they hold over time if we want to forecast in the future? Um, and it could be you know, just a fundamental misspecification. You know, if we're trying to observe a dynamic process and we just look at one point in time and try to deduce what's going on based on that, that may, may in fact not be telling us much about what the underlying process is. So you know, the way of putting this is I think most of our models are the structure of a behavior that we observe at one point in time. And we're implicitly building a model that we think is a model of process but it may not be possible to build a process model based on cross-section of time. 
Um, we tried to get around that by, you know, uh, particularly here in Toronto, we were fortunate having the TTS going back in 1986. You know, each TTS every five years is a uh, is a cross-sectional survey. We can build a model based on any one of those. You know, there's been a fair bit of work looking at, you know, do the parameters change over time? Or can we specify a, a model that holds over time? And pre-pandemic, we, you know, there was a fair bit of evidence about the work of my group, Professor Beep's group, looking at this question. There has been a fair stability in behavior in some sense. But I don't think that belies the overall argument that we should be thinking about dynamics in a much more serious way. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, the other point here, uh, which is, I think, both theoretical and in, in, with respect to implementation, is, you know, our thinking and our implementations need to be extensible. Uh, we can't, we can't, uh, you know, because again, theory and so forth is never static. Just as the world is not static, our understanding of the world and the way we might want to implement things in, in application is never static. Um, so another thing we've been very concerned about uh, in my group for a while, on the implementation side is building software frameworks in particular that are extensible or flexible because, and I think this is extremely important, if we look at the operational models in existence at the moment, most of them are hardwired into software that make them very, very difficult to change. Let's say we do have a better understanding of how activity generation goes on. It's almost impossible without throwing out the code and rewriting new code to implement that hypothesis, to test that hypothesis in software. And I think we're, we're, we're actually in a very kind of dangerous time right now where there's sort of new orthodoxies um, in terms of software being promoted by consulting agencies and so forth that are locking us into a view of how travel behavior not only should be modeled but occurs that is really limiting our ability to improve those models and to learn and, and test hypotheses. Um, I think similarly, you know, harking back to a couple of things I said earlier about random utility theory is I think we always have to be careful. Is that a box that we're locking ourselves into? Um, and, and are there other ways of thinking about behavior that we have to be open to? And what is, an, you know, what is, you know, how do we keep, okay. You know, a theory and understanding is flexible so that we can learn, we can, we can evolve over time. So in any event, um, some of the building blocks, if we're going to start thinking about uh, you know, modeling cities, modeling transportation, I realize I'm on slide 11 of 50 and, and I'm not going to get anywhere near done because um, <laughs> I always talk too much. But, you know, what's you know, we, we do need a representation of physical world. We need to create, you know, the digital, digital twins are the current term, but we need to create, create, a virtual, create a virtual world inside the computer where it's our laboratory. So we have to think about how we represent that physical world with, within, within the computer. Um, we do need an agent-based approach. Um, and I think then also uh, markets and networks are really important concepts to help us think about how agents behave. So I'll really try to speed up. I won't say anything about the physical world, but just to say, um, because, you know, first of all, we perceive the world, uh, you know, through our perceptions, that's a little redundant, but again, we have to bring it in the computer. So how do we actually represent land? How do we represent buildings? How do we represent the infrastructure? Those decisions about how, what data we gather, how we represent it um, in our data structures and our databases um, uh, within the computer are, are non-trivial. Um, I have a lot of slides on human agency, and, but I think many of you have seen much of this. But, but I think the key message, you know, as I said, given that we don't have much time here, is that I think it's absolutely fundamental we start with the notion of that it is human beings the cause of created cities, it's human beings that travel, it's decisions and motivations of human beings that we need to be understanding. That's the social science side, if you will, uh, and that's where why this is such a tough problem. But, but again, I think we need, we need to dig deeply into actually saying, for example, what do people actually do? And this, to me, is the basis of the so-called activity-based approach to travel demand modeling. What people do is they participate in activities. And so we can then start thinking about, well, what do we mean by an activity? Uh, what are the inputs to our you know, activities? What are the outputs? What are the motivations for engaging in an activity? Um, 
and I personally am a big fan of Maslow, um, who talked about motivated behavior, the theory of motivated behavior, and, and what I really love about this is, first of all, I think it, it, it does describe us uh, uh, you know, at a, a psychological level in terms of why we do things. We do things to satisfy needs. Um, but it's also universal. The argument, you know, and I, I think one of the things we need to be thinking much more about is to what extent can we have universal models? You know, as far as we know, the special theory of relativity or the general theory of relativity, little in quantum mechanics, holds throughout the universe. Um, we can't say that our model of mode choice for Toronto holds in New York or Montreal, let alone in, in uh, you know, Cape Town or, or Shanghai or Lagos or wherever you want to go in the world. Um, so, uh, but, but, you know, this is a theory that holds everywhere, to the extent that it's true. It's either true everywhere or it's not true. Um, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a major basis uh, for starting to think about, uh, you know, why do we do things and what motivates us and why do we choose one thing versus another. In particular, I think Maslow's, and I, I don't think this is necessarily the way, um, you know, many economists are, uh, think about it, but I would argue Maslow provides a very sound found, a theoretical foundation for much more kind of operational concepts that we're used to working with, particularly uh, uh, utility. And I, th I think the notion of motivated behavior is the psychological foundation of the economic concept of utility, which we use all the time. So, you know, there's a lot of um, criticism of the utility-based approach, and I've been sort of, you know, indirectly trashing around the utility theory. I actually think it's actually very fundamental, and I think it's a good theory. Um, and I do think the notion of utility, um, which I think ties back to Maslow, that basically we are at least boundedly rational, semi-rational in many things we do, I think most of the time we don't deliberately choose the thing that we don't like the best. You know, uh, any of you probably heard me say this, you're going to buy shoes, one pair of shoes, really, really, really fashionable, comfortable, the right color, exactly what you wanted, they're on sale. Another pair of shoes, they're ugly, the wrong color, they don't fit, they're uncomfortable, and they're expensive. Which pair of shoes do you buy? Okay. Oh yeah, I like those shoes, I'll buy the crappy shoes. You don't do that, right? The same with mode choice. Oh, I, I, one, one mode is faster, cheaper, more comfortable, safer, more reliable. I'll take the unreliable, expensive, unsafe mode. You know, we don't do that. Um, so there's lots of constraints on, on our information and so forth, but the notion is that we try to choose things that satisfy our needs. That's what utility is all about. Um, uh, we plan dynamically over time. Um, and, and, uh, and, and coming back to Maslow, the other thing that uh, I'm very keen on is the notion, again, trying to building blocks, you know, fundamental elements that, that we can then start building models around is the notion of projects. That uh, this is my way of translating Maslow's needs um, into, you know, what we do, that I think all of life fits into projects. We take on a work project, we take on a family project, we take on a housing project, we take on, um, you know, you know, a, sust uh, a sustenance project. Um, and so the argument is that projects, I think, provide both a behavioral way of, uh, well, our challenge in many respects, I've said human behavior is complex. So how, in a practical way, either theoretically or in modeling, can we deal with the enormous complexity of human behavior? And I think projects provide uh, you know, a way of going about that because it allows us to encapsulate and sort of break up that complexity into more bite-sized pieces. And so my argument is that if we say all human activity maybe resides in 8, 10, 12 project types that are universal, um, then, and within each project, we can think about the behavior going on with that project. So, so it's, it's starting to decompose the problem, classic engineering approach, decompose a complex system, a complicated system, into more bite-sized pieces that could be, with proper boundary and interface, be looked at independently, and then you put the pieces back together again. Um, so, so I think uh, the, this, this notion of projects is something that underlies all our work, and this is this is provisional. But the argument is, you know, if you start thinking about it, and again, it depends on how you can have sub sub projects and so forth. But you know, there's as I say, maybe about ten big buckets that all our activities go into, 
Um, and then maybe we can, as I say, then maybe we can start looking at how we model those activities within it. Um, another concept is the notion of resources. All behavior, all activity is constrained by the resources available to us. To me, a short-run short run behavior is one within fixed resources. Long-run decisions are ones that change resources. So a long-run decision of changing houses, changing jobs, going back to school, uh, perhaps buying another car, those are all decisions that are changing the resources over time. But then, you know, day to day, we have, we have a job, we have an income, we have a residential location, we have a car, and then we're making daily decisions uh, within those constraints. So I think this notion of resources, constraints, resource management is a way of starting to think about the interaction between short and long run, long run decisions. Uh, another thing we've certainly spent a lot of time thinking about over the years and trying to implement is the notion of markets. Because, because much of what we do occurs within a market. You go to, you go to the supermarket, you know, a market is a place that brings agents together to interact in one way, to and to exchange something, exchange information. This is kind of a market right here. We're exchanging information, even if it's kind of one way at the moment. Um, you know, uh, the farmers market. You, ex you exchange money for goods. Uh, stock markets. The transportation system is a market. A large amount of our interactions that we're interested in, including travel, occurs within markets. Markets are mechanisms that we, as human beings, have created as a way to facilitate interactions and particularly exchange. Um, and, and, and we can't possibly understand certain things like housing markets, the land use evolution, uh, work trip commuting, it's a labor market, without explicitly looking at how markets work. And this is something we spent a lot of time on in our own research looking at that. More and more, I'm also thinking that you know, networks need revisiting, and this is something I haven't really uh, or through yet, I mean, as transportation people, you know, we take networks for granted. Yeah, we have our road network, we have our, transport, our transit network, networks for networks, networks, we have assignment models, um, uh, and, and so forth. I think, you know, stepping back from a human behavior point of view, uh, I said a market is something, is something that brings people together to exchange something. The actual flow of exchange usually occurs on a network. So I, you know, I, 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 I get on the, uh, you know, I get on the computer, on the internet, which is a network, and I order uh, so, you know, some, something from Amazon. Uh, so I'm using a communications network to order that. Amazon dispatches a, a, a truck with the stuff. It travels on a network. The goods flow over a network. We all came here to interact um, with a network. And it's, you know, fundamentally, it's argued that cities exist to create social networks for interaction and ex exchange. So cities are both markets, but the actual exchanges generated within markets usually occur within a network. Networks are fundamental to all of all of the world. River system, water systems are networks. Uh, you know, tree is a network. Um, uh, networks are, are, are you know an actually fundamental organizing principle for life, uh, and even for the physical world. Um, so I think, you know, as I said, I'm not sure where it's going, but I think thinking deeply about the role of networks is important. Um, and uh, I think I've run, pretty much run out of time, um, and I hope oh, that's a spelling error. I haven't even gotten to micro-simulation. So micro-simulation simulation is an implementation method for our model. So, our, our, so our, our, we're interested in our process. We have our theory about what that process looks like. Um, we will translate that theory into a model representing the process as best we can. You know, so our theory is people are utility maximizers, the logic model. We then pose a logic model that you know has has some assumptions about the, the, the variables, the constraints, etc. Um, we then, how do we exercise that model? We exercise it usually within a simulation model. Simulation is a, a very generic approach. That, that allows us to deal with evolutionary dynamic processes, processes that are not uh, analytically, uh, you know, we can't just write an equation to solve, you know, y is a function of x. Um, we, we, the only way we can, we can describe, exercise the models numerically, algorithmically, usually because it's a dynamic process, we're looking at how something changes over time. It's usually stochastic, there are random elements, we don't know for certain what's going to happen. Um, and all these, uh, you, you know, and again, there's not an equilibrium necessarily we can solve for. If we could define 
a system state is at equilibrium, maybe we don't have to simulate, maybe we don't have to model the path, we can just solve for the equilibrium conditions. But if we accept the argument that, that cities and even travel are never in equilibrium, then we don't have those conditions. The only way we can forecast or predict in any way is to actually evolve the system. Um, and so simulations exist as long as computers. Micro simulation simply means we're doing that at a very decided level, at the level of the agent. And so micro simulation is the way we will implement an agent based model because it allows us to explore all the agent interactions in, in whatever way we want to do. And, and there's so, so, so there are many pragmatic reasons for why we want to micro simulate. I, won't, I don't have time to talk about them all. Um, but, uh, but uh, you know, micro-simulation act can actually be a very computationally efficient way of computing in complex situations, even if they're not particularly dynamic. Um, but it's also behaviorally correct. I mean, if we want to model agent interactions, it's, uh, it's it, you know, we can't write just an equation or you know, a set of simultaneous equations that really describe those agent interactions. We have to simulate how those, those micro-simulate how those agents are interacting in order to get an aggregate outcome. I mean, one of the paradoxes, perhaps, of, of our world is that we're, from a planning point of view, we're usually interested in the aggregate outcomes. Um, the, you know, so, you know, I always say, you know, what the TTC wants to know about is how many people per, in the peak hour are southbound on the Young Street subway, line one, uh, from Bloor Station in the morning peak hour. They don't care whether Bob or Sally or Fred or Sue are taking, you know, individuals are taking the subway. They want to know how many people are there. And it's about 30,000 people to hand in. Um, they don't care who the 30,000 people are. But the argument of agent-based micro-simulation is the best way to get to that 30,000 number is to simulate Bob and Sally and Sue, wake them up in the morning and say, are you taking the subway or not? Are you going to work? Um, and, and so that's the micro-simulation hypothesis that the best way to get the aggregate out at the end of the day, in practical terms, the best way to get that 30,000 uh, number, or whatever it is, is to simulate from the bottom up. Um, and, and, uh, and so, uh, and just at the hour, and I've skipped over lots of things and probably forgot to say a lot of things, so this is a slide I often throw up uh, just to give you some sense of uh, how, how many people I've inflicted some of these ideas on them over the years, and a few of the people that uh, have been involved in this work for a long, long time. And always, you know, very, 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 very grateful to each and every one of them. Um, it's a big family. Um, as much as I enjoy the research, which was, I went into the university um, academia because I wanted to do research, the surprise was the real reward is working with people like you all the time. Keeps me young, keeps me excited, and uh, it's good to see people, you know, hopefully not too damaged by my ideas going out and then doing good things in the world. So I'll stop there, and we have time. I'm very happy to take, take some questions. So thank you very much for the budget.